I want to bring Maggie Dents up on stage first. Here she is, the second Mavis Bramston. Yep. Oh. Uh, the filmmaker, <laughs> Stefan Wellink. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> uh, Bob Fitzgerald, his partner, he's behind the camera there. <laughs> Bob will just set the camera and be up here in a minute. Anthony Ackroyd's in the audience. Come on up, Anthony. We've got a list of... Anne Drummond is... We're very excited to have Anne Drummond here. Anne Drummond was the original vision mixer for Mavis Bramston show. And Richard Walsh. So pleased to have you in the documentary and back here again. Now, Stefan, we might start with you. I know this, is, this documentary has taken you years and years to make. For example, those interviews with Maggie and Carol, they were done several years ago. How many years have you spent making this doco? Um, half a lifetime. Yeah. Now, I think. No, um. <laughs> it, it seems like it, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, nine years, to put it all together. Um, and it was really interesting because... We, we met at the Golden Age Cinema, if you remember. Uh, no. Pat okay. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. We met at the Golden Age Cinema. Right, okay. yes. So, uh, and, and those interviews that you saw, uh, except for, for Barry, uh, were all done there. And Anthony. We were done down in Barrel. And it was one of the most nerve-wracking days of my life because I, I said, I'd love to have a clear set now. Would you mind leaving the room? And they all went and got chairs and just sat around and just, just watched, you know, as we did the interviews. And it was, uh, it was quite a baptism of fire. But I was, uh, at times I felt like I was in another world doing, doing those interviews because I, they were people I'd watched as I was a young boy growing up. And there I was sitting across from Carol Ray and, and Maggie and, and David Sale and all those wonderful people that you saw. And it was like a dream come true, as is having it being shown here in this theatre, which I succumbed to as a very young boy. Um, it's a real thrill to be here, and thank you all, by the way, for, for coming out. Yeah. Maggie, when you weren't in your Mavis Bramston garb and you're going around the shops, did people recognise you as Mavis? Could you go anonymously through the world? Oh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, it was, it was not a problem at all, thank God. I was lucky. Were you ever worried that you were going to be typecast to be, uh, uh, to be in comedy shows even though you were an actor? I was, a, yes, I was concerned and it did carry over for about, because I was actually in the show only for 1965, but it does say that I was there till 1968. So I didn't actually do much television in those days except on things like game shows, which were sort of the bread and butter. And... Um, but I went back to the theatre, so I was fine. But it did make me paranoid about being too well, too long in a show, so which is why I left the Sullivans after a short time. Just kept moving on. Anthony, you had some uh, fantastic things to say about satire. And when we did a screening like this in Avoca Beach, someone in the audience asked why Australian TV doesn't do this type of comedy show anymore. I mean, we know the ABC, you know, mm. gives it their best shot. But for commercial TV, it just doesn't seem to happen at all. What's your theory on why we've dropped off doing this type of comedy now? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, it's so, uh, you know, comedy is king in the United States and in England and satire is, you know, the jewel in the crown. So I'm not sure why it doesn't take off in... Uh, maybe it's not held in the same regard, uh, which, which is why I think it's just, you know, 
this documentary is just fantastic, and all you know, all the performers and all the people on the stage uh, should be applauded for you know all that groundbreaking. Uh, sowing the seeds of so much that came after. So I wish I had a simple answer for you, but I certainly agree we need more of it. Mm. Do people agree? More satire yeah. in Australia? <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, Stefan, uh, w we all think that this is an important show. We're here today. But you had a lot of trouble convincing Channel 7 that was important. In fact, they almost deny ownership of it to this day, don't they? They don't... They won't even admit to you that it's a show that they made in-house. They're, they're so uninterested today. That's right. They didn't want to release any of the Mavis Bramson footage to me. And they said their lawyers told them, and this is the archivist who told me this, their lawyers told them that they didn't own the copyright on the show. And I said, well, you better look at the end of each program. It says copyright ATN Channel 7. Mm -hmm. And if you don't own it, you're in a lot of trouble uh, for passing off that you do. So... It was a very, a very difficult time. They didn't let us have anything. Um, we were able to, uh, to get hold of the footage that you've seen uh, through private means. And we were able to put it together in such a way using a thing called fair dealing or fair use, where you would have noticed that leading into many of the, uh, many of the skits, someone would be describing what that skit was or talking about time and place. And that's allowable uh, under the Australian legal system. In fact, the same in the US, where it's called fair use, fair dealing. But you've got to construct the story then in a very different way. Uh, and it's got to be done with uh, fairly meticulously. And you can't go one second over what you said you were going to do in any sketch, otherwise they can, uh, they can send the lawyers in on you. So we were very, very careful in how we put that together. We had the best lawyer, Sean Miller, probably the best entertainment lawyer in, in Australia who gave us our advice um, and I've made other films where we use a similar technique so uh, it does work for anyone who wants to make a film and wants a bit more advice on that we can talk about it later on but that's the way to do it. Uh, we will ask if anyone in the audience has got questions we'll come to you with a roving mic so please someone be brave enough to be the first person to ask. Um, Anne as someone that worked at Channel 7 in that period um, can you tell us what it was like to work there and does it surprise or shock you today to know that they're so uninterested in it, they deny having the copyright for it? Oh, look, it was, it was absolutely wonderful. And um, we'd gone to work, we would have gone to work whether we were paid to or not. Um, and Ken Shady was absolutely wonderful. He was an audio operator. I mean, I was just a vision mixer doing what I was doing. But he was in the audio booth scribbling on bits of paper, ideas for skits that they used in the show. I just think that that film was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. So wonderfully put together. And I mean, Ken's been dead for three years. Um, but it's just so wonderfully put together and edited and I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it. It was absolutely super. Mm. <laughs> Vision mixing is a, is a real art because you don't want to miss this great reaction from somebody. So did you attend rehearsals and were you kind of... Which actors played well to the cameras and how did you know when to switch? Oh, well, the director tells you what to do all the time. And, I mean, there's a bit of a time lapse between when he says, and you do whatever, fade in or out, or do it abruptly or whatever. So it's a, a bit of a combination effort, yeah. Mm. But it was live to air. Yeah. It was amazing, really. Yeah. Maggie, you talk about the adrenaline rush of, you know, actors getting scripts, you know, literally as they were they're going to air. I mean... It, mm. Tell us about how that was. I mean, is that because you had theatre training? You were kind of used to that? And does adrenaline give you a better performance? Well, I think adrenaline certainly does help. But, you know, to make the show topical, obviously they waited till the very last minute. And that's why Gordy, Carol and Barry carried those clipboards because they didn't see those until that very last minute. And that made it very, very topical. And I think it was a a rule that it had, the show had to go out within the week because the next week, of course, it was going to be even more topical. But I think one of the things that was wonderful about that period was that you had Rags, Rupert Henderson. There's a 
Nice Rupert there. Um, <laughs> there's a proper Rupert. Uh, so you had Rupert Henderson, you had Jim Osborne, and you had Harry Chester, who was also known as the Smiling Axeman, because um, <laughs> he used to go through the uh, uh, money bags and see what was being wasted. But what you had, of course, was Channel 7 as a proper, a proper station. Mm. It had a huge wardrobe department. It made sets. It had proper dressing rooms. I mean, it was a complex. There's nothing like that now. No. There is not, you know. So doing a show like that would become very difficult just from that point of view. And Ken Shady was a staff writer. Mm. And Lynn, oh, Lynn, there was a Lynn who worked with him, and I'm ashamed yeah. to say I can't mm. remember her Lynn name. Dyer. But they were the staff writers, and they'd been working there for a long time. All mm. that was the backup. Mm. So the people like Michael Plant, and David Sale and Johnny Finlayson and that, that, all that mob could focus on the show because everything was just this wonderful team that would take over every other aspect of the show. How we miss it. Yeah. Now, Richard, you of course weren't there to see a lot of this stuff being made as you talked about, but you revealed to us at Evoca that you, was, you were a struggling student. You didn't even get to see the show go to air because you couldn't afford a TV set. How much did TVs <laughs> cost back in the day? I have no idea, but I certainly didn't have one. And the, I was, uh, I mean, we forget. I mean, you know, this is very early days of TV. TV had begun in 1956, so it's in the first decade. I mean, t coming back to points that have been made in the production side, you know, all these stations did have big production, big staff. You know, one of the, the answer to your question is why we don't have this on commercial TV today is that none of them have any staff. Yeah. And, and because of that, they've lost their creativity. Creativity was built into the fabric of, the, of each of the stations mm. because shows were being made there. Mm. There were musicians and, and script writers and so on. I wasn't on staff, but um, uh, so that gave a texture to how tele television come out of radio and radio had been entirely produced in-house. You didn't have pr production companies. You, had, you did have pi Colgate Palmolive crew but, but, and so on, but, but anyway, it's a different world. Um, but but coming back to it, yeah, I mean, you know, the homes did not all have television. Mm. And as students, where we were kind of floating between, you know, couches, <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't have access to TV, so I didn't really see very much of my material. Uh, I knew it was there, and I knew I got a check, and I knew what which ones they'd used. I knew that because I was talking to Rag's office. Um, yeah, it was a bit disappointing. <laughs> a bit disappointing. It was I, I love uh, you know, the, the, the little bits of mine that were there tonight to remind me of... of uh, I can't believe I could write like that. Um, <laughs> so it was good fun. Yeah, it was, it was great. But, but I unfortunately didn't participate in the writer's uh, room. That actually isn't the way I work anyhow. I prefer working on my own. David Sale always talks about, tells me that it, there were no real jokes about, no real gay jokes in there because it wasn't a news cycle thing. I mean, they were doing camp send-ups, but there was no such thing as gay liberation, so there was nothing to send up. And that makes me wonder, can you remember any of the topics that Rupert Henderson rejected? Were there certain things where, you know, he, he did sort of allow a lot of stuff to go to air, but was there things that you were aware of, topics that, mm, I don't think I'll do that because it'll probably get rejected? Well, yeah, I mean, <coughs> this was occurring at a very time when we were before the courts, 1964, when this show began. Indeed, uh, Mavis Bramston's show put on a fundraiser for Oz magazine because of our legal costs. So it was of a sexual nature. Rags Henderson was, of course, also running the Sydney Morning Herald. I was fired as one of the book uh, reviewers because one of my a, a re book I reviewed about the pill was regarded as too permissive. <laughs> uh, I had suggested the pill was quite good for unmarried women, uh, which didn't seem to me to be too startling a statement, but was for them. Um, so most of the stuff that was knocked out was sexual in nature, but some of it was political. Uh, you know, Vietnam was beginning to take off, and although you, you saw that, some of that, I think, came 
later on. I mean, obviously, we were worried about. There's a sketch. Oh, there's some words there that I wrote about the the army and navy and so on. But but the when Vietnam was taking off, that was very political. And I ultimately, in in the early 70s, began a newspaper, the only news, Nation Review, which is the only newspaper opposed the Vietnam War. Mm. The Herald was very pro Vietnam, and you certainly couldn't say anything that was too against the war in Mavis Bramson in the, in the year. I was right, really wrote in the first two years. Um, satire moved to, moved to one side after that, and I think part of the process of, of it becoming less satirical was they did actually, uh, particularly with Ampol and everything else, they, they did become a bit edgy about some political mm. things in truth. Bob, you edited uh, a lot of that footage. What, what, what's some of the favourite stuff that, that you had fun putting together in that doco? I think, as Stefan said, we had to work around the fair dealing issues and it was really finding uh, comedy sketches that matched what the interviewees were talking about. Mm. And of course we had to go through, and I think Stefan spent a couple of weeks, I think you went down to the National Film Archives with him and looked yeah. at every episode. Mm that was available of the Brampton show. So I ended up going through most of those too yeah. in the edit suite and uh, it brought back a lot of memories. I, I think I was 17 at the time the show went to air. I didn't really take a lot of notice at the time because I was doing other things, but I kind of learnt in the editing process about a lot of things of the time that I kind of missed out on mm -hmm. because as a 17-year-old, I wasn't really politically aware of what was going on and it was kind of like you live in the moment. It's only when you reflect back on history that you think, my God, that was a significant time. Yeah. I didn't realise how important and how much change was happening. Incredible. Do we have any questions in the crowd? I'll come running down to you with a mic. Anyone? Yeah, if someone's going to be brave, here we go. I just wonder if you came across how the, um, I, I believe in 64 the show was only shown in Sydney and then it went national. I remember my parents were pretty obsessed with it in regional Victoria. So would that have, when would that have started? And I guess it was before networking too. Was it on different stations all around the country? I think it went national uh, in, in 65. Um, and basically, I think it went out over most stations, but certainly there were towns that didn't get it, which was a little tricky for me when I turned up as Mavis under, <laughs> under instruction from a Ampol to open a new petrol station and nobody had the clue where I'd come from <laughs> and what on earth was I doing. But to be honest, I'm not quite sure how many... I guess the bigger country towns got it, but it certainly went national once it went. Once Ampol picked up the sole sponsorship, uh, then it was off and running. A quick one to Richard too while I've got the mic. Richard, you've worked with a lot of executives during your time in corporate Australia. Uh, it struck me how um, Rags Henderson was so involved. I mean, you'd send him the copy, he'd edit it, it was almost like a script editor, and forward it on if he approved it. Was that common? Did you find that with many pe other people you work with? I know Kerry Packer was famous for his critical response after something went to wear, but many of them get involved in the creative process? No, I, I, to be honest with you, I think <laughs> Seven was pretty desperate to put the show on. Uh, and I, I think it was alluded to somewhere I, I heard, I mean, uh, clearly Nine was very strong, was the number one network, and Ten, w which was then O and Ten, were about to begin. I mean, the answer to your question is that, that people like Packer, so Frank Packer in this case, in those days, were just absolute kings of their uh, network. They, 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 there was no room for any uh, rebellious uh, things. I mean, they were very famous. Frank Packer was famous if his horse won on Saturday, he would ask the station to run it. He would ring the station, ask them to show it at 10 o'clock at night because he had some people over for dinner who hadn't seen the race. Um, and, and the show, whatever was showing, you know, gone with the wind would be stopped and we'd have the seventh race from Randwick because Frank's horse had won it. Um, so uh, this was the only situation, I think, anywhere where the ownership didn't have very great control. It was live. It was very dangerous, live, uh, and um, 
and, and a lot of the script writers like myself were freelancers and so on. So I think that Henderson felt that he had to uh, control it, and I uh, certainly because I did other writing, of course, in those days, uh, I've never struck anything remotely like that before, but I think it was because it was live, because it was topical, it's obviously quite hot. They love the control, like, they love the frisson of controversy, but they didn't want to lose the adver they didn't want to lose the advertiser and didn't want to, uh, you know, they're all snobs, they didn't want to, you know, uh, lose their part place in Sydney society for what that was. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, we had network bosses back then. They were kind of scary, but they loved TV, didn't they? You know, did you get the feeling that Rupert Henderson really loved making TV? Oh, I think he was... Fan I mean, what there was at Channel 7 was a viewing room, which was... So they were able to gather there on the recording day, and they would be, they'd all be there, every recording. So... And the cast were always invited up for drinks afterwards. And there would be Rupert Henderson, Jim Oswin, Harry Chester. There would be the um, advertising agency for Ampol, which was Nixon Incompetent, we used to call it, but it was Nixon, <laughs> Nixon Competent. And, uh, and so they'd be there. And it was, it was a big mob, actually. And also the heads of Ampol would be there. So Sir Mac Leonard would be there and I'm afraid I can't remember all their names, but that was a big mob of important men who would be watching the show every single recording. They were always there. I, the only censorship I recall was uh, Kevin Coulson, who was a musical theatre performer, was doing a number, and it was doing a number about cow cockies, and Ampol stepped in and were concerned about the farmers that bought Ampol petrol. So that's the only time I can recall that they pulled a number. But obviously, from what Richard's saying, numbers were pulled prior to that. They didn't, they didn't get learnt. Yeah. But, but Kevin, yeah, had learnt the number. Uh, question from the audience. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Fabulous documentary. I just w wonder how long did the three of them stay together, Carol Ray, Gordon Chater and Barry Creighton? So they didn't do the whole four no. years? What? They did the... Uh, Carol, uh, they did the shows in 1964 and then when the show started in 65 Barry, Carol and Gordy and then Carol left at some point during the year uh, and that's when Miriam I think that's when Miriam Carlin came in around the time of Michael's tragic death, Bridget Lenehan was one of the permanent team you probably know more about this than me but yeah, so, so Carol uh, Yes, June left as well. So it shifted a bit yeah. in that, yes, after like the first half of the year. What about Gordon? Did he stay? Gordy stayed for the whole year. Right. And I was always told initially they were going to, they ran the idea of calling it the Gordon Chater Show. Um, but I don't know if that's myth or not. But, but he said, no, I, I don't want that. And that's when they started to do the naming process about Mavis Bramston. And Mavis was not going to be in the show as I understood it. Nolene had, had gone to England and I happened to be coming back from England and the, I'd worked at Seven before and Ampol said, we want the character, we can use the character. Mm. So half of my salary was paid by Ampol. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> and I got free petrol. <laughs> and, and you got a free trip at one stage too. Did Qantas fly you somewhere special once to, well, as a promotional? What happened was... Qantas were taking delivery of a, of a new plane and they had approached Channel 7 for publicity and Channel 7 had said, well, we've got J well, Johnny O'Keefe, who was a huge star. Yeah. And then they realised that they were going to start the Mavis Bramston show in, you know, 90, early 65. So they said, well, we wanted to do a mock-up of Mavis arriving, so we'll send Mavis and she can do the big entry. So I was sent to the Boeing plant in Seattle, and, which was a fantastic experience because the plant is extraordinary. You know, to see all those planes parked undercover, well, of course, um, was just amazing. And they, so the plane, I can't remember which one it was. So the plane was virtually to be empty. It was going to be kitted out here. So they just had seats for the crew, which happened to be all of Qantas's top pilots and uh, co-pilots because they'd been over to learn about this plane and me. 
and uh, the plane being almost empty, they decided to dress it. So they gave me a, a bedroom and they gave me a, a games deck area and a sitting room. So that's why, that's why I was travelling. We stopped at Hawaii because we had to refuel and I was seen skipping along the beach. None of this was ever seen. And then I arrived and the, what was really sad was that they, they, they showed the plane landing but then they did a cut and the next thing was you saw me coming down the steps. So it could have been the total mock-up. <laughs> You know, but it wasn't. I mean, it was all that energy that had gone into doing this flight. I don't know what Qantas felt. Probably still taking revenge, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Are questions from anyone in the crowd? Any more questions? Just while we're talking about it, uh, Maggie, James Manning and I do a podcast called TV Gold. And we talk about, you know, we've just done our best and best for the year. And uh, we both absolutely love The Lost Flowers of Alice Hart, oh. which you can watch on Prime Video. It's such an extraordinary standout TV series this year. Will you be in the next series of Heartbreak High when that launches on Netflix soon? Yes, I will. And I've got a boyfriend who's here today called Peter Carroll. <laughs> Stand up, Peter Carroll. Stand up. You will still be my boyfriend. It's what we've filmed. It hasn't gone to air yet. <laughs> well, that's We're hoping it'll spin off to a series that'll be limited, I suppose. Yeah, but, sounds um, great. Yes. Uh, we've had to have intimacy counselling, which was quite, quite strenuous, wasn't it, PT? It was quite, you know. I have to say, I've spent my entire life with people saying to me when they do remember Mavis, oh, I watched you from behind a door. Yeah. And that made me feel like some sort of porn star, yeah. which I quite, I quite liked, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Stefan, what, what are your hopes now for the documentary? Where do you hope... Uh, you hope you're still trying to sell it, hoping someone might screen it, stream a network? What are you trying for? Well, we're looking for a, a distributor, um, a sales agent... Uh, Doxville has picked it up, which is a, a streaming platform. Um, I think you might be able to see that very, very soon on Doxville. Yeah. Um, no one else has expressed a lot of interest. I've, I've certainly been trying to get it out there. But I think the more of these types of screenings that we have, uh, the better the chance that someone will be there who'll say, listen, yeah. let's do something. Because if you're not out there, you're not known, you know. Um, We've held off for too long, really, in, in doing this. We should have probably gone a bit earlier, but, you know, when you're a, a small independent filmmaker, we don't have the, uh, the, the PR machine like the guys have with the, uh, with, with the soccer film that's going on next door, you know, and, oh. and it's... I'm not complaining, it's just, you know, you're kind of restrained by that, constrained by that. But, um, but it's been a, gr a, great, a great experience to make this film. Um, Bob has been great to work with. He's done a wonderful job on the edit. There's no, no question about that. He, he absolutely brilliant, Bob, and thank you. And we're, we're making another film um, now. Uh, we're, we're going to make, well, we started, we've done all the principal photography. We uh, film on Tommy Tico is the next one that will we'll roll off at, at, at some point. We hope to still be upright, Bob, at that yeah. point, don't we? Well, yeah, yeah, but uh, that's right, yeah. we have to remain healthy. But, but look, it, it, it's been an absolute pleasure making it. It's, it's got to be a passion, and it has been for both uh, Bob and I. And I think just to meet the people that we've met, and I didn't know a lot really about Mavis. I was only 10 when it premiered. But I've learned so much just going through the process of making the film and doing the research and just meeting the wonderful people uh, like Maggie and, and others that I've met. And it was really Barry Creighton that kicked the whole thing off when, when I had a chat with him, and he was lamenting about not having anyone celebrate the 50th anniversary, which you heard him talk about. And mm. that just got me thinking that, you know, I think this is a story that needs to be told. Uh, yeah. I think one of the highlights uh, for me, certainly, and Stefan, is that we showed the film to Carol Ray. Uh, it was in almost a final version, and we drove up to Kempsey where Carol was living with her daughter. And uh, we sat her down in front of a computer, obviously wasn't on a screen and played the whole thing and Carol talked throughout uh, and she said, I didn't say that, 
you know, like <laughs> she really disputed quite a few things that, <laughs> that she actually said and she on camera. She was on camera. camera speaking. I didn't see yeah. that. Yeah. That's you, Carol. <laughs> but it was a highlight for us, yeah. and uh, she passed away 18 months ago, and we got to see her see the film. So that, for me, was a you, highlight. You tell the story about the licence, her licence. Oh, yes. The other thing was she was chuffed... Uh, that morning when we arrived because she'd been up to the RTA or whatever they call them these days at 98 and did her driver's test and yeah. passed with full colours. Yeah. And she, she was sharp as a tack. Yeah. I yeah. mean, her brain was... Her brain was... <laughs> Ticking over like you wouldn't yeah. believe. Yeah, it was incredible. You'd say to Carol, happy birthday. She'd say, darling, I'm just so thrilled I got my driver's licence again. I mean, she's a shocking driver. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's, truly. Yeah. She had an accident driving back from Marion Street where she was working and just sort of ran off the road and the car went down and then she just... And she came out of the car and crawled back up the road and, you know, summed a ride back. I mean, but a shocking driver. That's yeah. It might have been why she was so happy that she got it. <laughs> That's the where I'm the point was that she never deteriorated. <laughs> yeah. no. Well, She's she used to drive from Kempsey to Sydney. Yes. Like, yes. Lo w long into her 90s. Yes. And I said... Do you honestly drive five hours? And telling, I stopped for a cup of tea at Sheila's place. I said, that's still four hours yeah. drive. Yeah, <laughs> quite incredible. I really applauded that you made this because there is this funny thing that goes on with nostalgia. If we think of Channel 7, they celebrated the 30th anniversary with Amanda Keller. They did a primetime special on how great Mavis Bramston was. But yeah, then 50 years later, when it was celebrating an, an even more important milestone, Seven did not want to know about it. So I don't know whether it management changes or nobody works at the station who remembers it anymore or whether somebody decides that the people who will remember Mavis Bramson are too old and they don't fit the advertising demographic, so we're not going to celebrate it. So it's very important that we continue to make shows like this because we can't rely on networks to even celebrate their own successes anymore. That's, that's true. That's true. Yeah. I, I wanted to say uh, congratulations uh, to Maggie uh, on getting her Order of Australia in AM, which was, what, about 18 months ago? Was it a year ago? I, 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 was, I was very blessed to get uh, at the same time as Carol, yeah. and Carol knew that she'd received it. So it was very, very long overdue for Carol. Yeah. I think it's just appalling that, you know, she, she really just was about to die. Yeah. And, but she knew, and um, it's true that we wouldn't have had Mavis without Carol. She was extraordinary. And she had, that, what was wonderful about those people like Gordy and Carol and Michael Plant was so fierce about the show and that's why Michael's death was really such a tragedy because I've got memories of Michael just up in that room that I talked about having a drink and going at Rupert Henderson saying, no, we, you know, we this, 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 you know. And, they'd sort of, and so he was the fighter and that's why those, those first you know, shows are so wonderful in the first sort of six months of that first year. And Carol Ray's biography has just been released yes, as a book yes, too. Yes. So if you want to know more about Carol Ray, there's a fantastic biography which goes back through her British film career and the Broadway play that was a flop and just such an incredible career Amazing. in front of and behind the camera. That's the really important part. Yeah. yeah. She was very, very important. Yeah. Yeah. A wonderful career. Please, everyone, give it up for the stars of the Mavis Bramson Show. Thank you.